nationally acclaimed illustrator, author, creator and designer of theatrical posters, best known for your Lincoln Center theater posters, and your psychedelically powerful style of realism. James, if you were to define yourself using one word, what would it be? It wouldn't be psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, the word I, I would use is a strange one for an artist. Um, it's conservative. Throughout all these years, I've been drawing realistically through all kinds of periods where realism was not in vogue and uh, where uh, heavy stylization was in vogue, and I've resisted it all uh, and, and stuck to this sense that the human figure was what I needed in my, my creative work. James McMullen was born in 1934 in the north of China and he spent his childhood in Chifu. After a lifetime of international success as an artist, James chose to regress and take a closer look at his childhood years. With his latest book, Leaving China, an artist paints his World War II childhood, James created 54 full pages of watercolor illustrations to explore deep rich and detailed memories of himself and his surroundings as a little boy bounded by war. I admired his work a lot. I had met him briefly when he was working at Pushpin since I knew Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast. I kept sending him mash notes telling him how much I admired his work. And uh, that succeeded in melting him down a little bit, and we had lunch, and we found we enjoyed each other's company. And um, we've been friends ever since. If you ask me what uh, I remember most or what meant the most to me in writing this book and, and trying to recapture the anxiety of those years. It was yeah. a kid listening to a bunch of soldiers running, you know, down the street. But um, in the circumstances of that time, uh, I, I knew that it was a symbol of the fact that we were under the control of those troops, you know? That brings me to my next question, because you said in the book that although your family was neutral, you felt like the Imperial Army controlled your life. Yes, Anyhow, they did, yeah. Can you give me some more examples of, you know, that kind of control that they had over your family and you? Well, I mean, one thing, we, we had instructions that uh, were we ever on a street to meet a Japanese officer, we had to bow, you know, we had to uh, mm -hmm. make it clear that we, um, that, that we were less and they were more, you know. But the, the other thing that was kind of scary were these barricades. And at the barricades, they had um, like a little uh, nurse uh, with hypodermics. And um, if you uh, didn't have your papers showing that you had been uh, inoculated against typh typhoid fever, they would inoculate you. But the scary part of it was, is that they use one needle for everybody. I thought it was a proper exclamation point at the end of his career. We might have a few good pictures left in us, but it was a wonderful culmination of, of everything that he had done before. Here I ended up as a theater poster designer, you know, in our time. But I, I think that, that what's in my work is a very strong connection to uh, other ideas about art, you know? The, the most uncomfortable time for me was the 60s. The 1960s was very uncomfortable for me because it was all about think outside the box. Everything you've believed in, turn it upside down, you know, challenge yourself. And it always seemed false to me, you know, that why would I turn everything I've ever known or believed in upside down? But it was very, very powerful in those years that 
if you were an artist, that's, that's what you did. And, you know, frankly, a lot of artists, in fact, do that and mm -hmm. do that very well. Through all of these years, I've been drawing the figure. Now, I, I don't know if you know enough about art schools, but drawing the figure is now back a little bit. Mm -hmm. But for, I would say, 30 years, it was like the stupidest thing you could do was to try to draw the human figure. Uh -huh. Because, you know, we had cameras, we had, you know, all these other ways of circumventing the skill that you needed to draw the human figure. But I have always found it so exciting and so that it, it brings you into the moment in, in, in a way that is very hard to do any other way. It's the challenge of being in front of somebody and trying to draw them, trying to understand what they look like, is very, very hard, very, very hard. I always wanted to be able to work direct on paper without tracing. And he was actually doing it. I, my ideas seemed to me to be too complex to work directly because I worked with a pen and ink. ink. And um, he was doing it with uh, essentially a brush and was able somehow to to work on this blank sheet of paper which I was in, in awe of I, and I guess maybe maybe part of it was I wanted I wanted to get his secret how he was able to do this because it still seems magical to me through Chinese scrolls James Macmillan discovered art which became not only his biggest infatuation, but also in escape. Art helped James deal with his introversion, discover an inner strength, but most importantly, find his identity. What I see in Jim's work is an ability to capitalize on accident. It's the thing that gives a drawing life. If you start a picture knowing what it's going to look like when you finish, it's going to be dead. It's starting a picture and finding that the end product is totally different. That, that's exciting. You've said that your very first conscious idea of art came from looking at Chinese scrolls. Yes. What about them did you find so powerful? The calligraphy of writing, the actual making the marks of writing, and as you know, they hold it in, in great esteem, you know, how beautiful your character, the making of characters is, so that the, 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 it's a connection that we don't have in our art, is that all mark making is connected and all of it can be beautiful. So when the thing that I loved about scrolls is that the marks are so simple in a way and yet they can do so much with it. They can make mountains, they can make clouds, they can make trees, they can make people, they can make dogs, you know. <laughs> it's, all, it's all there. So that it gave me my first sense of abstraction because that's what it is. It's like lines are abstract, but with lines you can do all kinds of things, right? Artists do what they are. Jim is, is more careful and uh, observant. He's able to do it for various reasons, the medium he uses, the, his temperament and whatnot. So after a while I simply accepted that I'll never be able to do what he does, but on the other hand he can't, can't do what I do. Throughout your <coughs> childhood you found yourself in China, in India, right. Canada and the US. How do you think that that affected you? It gave me a, a terrible terror of traveling. I hate going anywhere anymore. I don't like, because all of that traveling uh, during the war was, we were, it was like we were fleeing all the time, you know? And I didn't like being in an, a new place. I hated going to new schools. I went to 11 schools before My I graduated goodness. from high school. As much as you adapt, as much as you change your accent, as much as you learn a language, some deep part of you is an outsider. And since I really had no base from which to feel this is my home, this is who I am, I, I think I've always felt like an outsider. And I know that you had a difficult relationship with your father as well, right? And you've said that you 
felt sometimes as if you didn't measure up to certain masculine expectations that he had. How, what was that all about? How does that influence, you know, who you became as an artist and just as a person too? My father was worried about me and actually I didn't know how much he was worried about me till I read the letters that he, that he wrote to my mother during the war. But because I was this timid kid, he, he worried about me as any parent would. I mean, I, if I had a son and it was a timid boy, I would be very worried about that kid, you know, being out in the world. Anyway, so he worried. So all his letters, either to my mother or to me was, you know, I hope you're doing better in sports. I hope, you know, you're playing soccer more. I hope you, and also he wanted me to be good at mathematics, which I was definitely <laughs> not good at mathematics. So there was, uh, the, 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 because of these letters and because of my, my mother, you know, being instructed long distance by my father of how she should toughen me up, you know, so she would send me to boxing lessons. And I just got beat up, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, was, it didn't help me to, to, you know, to be a tougher kid or, or to, you know, learn how to beat up the other kids. Um, so, uh, but I, you know, I think the point of my book is, and, you know, I hope that some kid reads it and is helped by this, that I began to realize I loved art and that I could draw. Very early I learned that I could draw. I, I mean, I was drawing when I was seven, eight years old, you know, and drawing pretty well. And I also, uh, like to look at things and to copy them and stuff. So um, by the time I was uh, 10, I had this feeling there's a future out there, you know, and it's not going to be about all of these things that I'm being judged on now about, you know, gymnastics and soccer and mathematics. It's, it, there's, there's another world, you know, and in a weird way, I, 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 I had some inner toughness because I saw this possibility. I think we both like telling stories. We both like our pictures to be the kind of picture you can either figure out what the story is or invent your own story. But there's something going on there. It's, it's storytelling that we love, I think. My mother arranged for me to go to this class and uh, the same thing happened that always happened. I try very hard, but eventually, you know, I was the punching bag for all the other boys, you know. So I didn't cry and that was my big triumph that I, I wasn't going to cry. So Mr. Ryan, the, the instructor, after the class was over, he said, let's take a walk. And so we went and walked outside uh, in uh, just in the entry of the school. And uh, he said, you, you, you don't like sports too much, eh, Jimmy? <laughs> and I, I said, no, Mr. Ryan. And he said, well, I'll tell your mother it's not the right class for you. And he said, but what do you like to do? And, uh, and I said, I, liked, I like to draw, Mr. Ryan. And uh, he said, oh, well, then you'll be an artist and not a boxer. <laughs> and it was like the kindest thing that anyone had said to me my whole <laughs> life, particularly coming from this macho guy. I mean, that was the significance wow. of it, that he was giving me permission in a way. Forget about the stuff that you can't do. Do what you can do, you know? And it was like an incredibly powerful message. James McMillan's first theatrical poster was in 1976. Ever since then, he has created illustrations for every major American magazine. He has invented his own method of figure drawing, called High Focus, which he has been teaching at New York City's School of Visual Arts for over 30 years. In addition to creating and illustrating six award-winning picture books for children with his wife, Kate. I don't know why he's so successful. He's just trouble for anybody he works for. But uh, there's nobody else who does what he does. So the, if you work, if you hire him, you just have to take his complaining and, uh, and make the best of it. Besides drawing, painting, more than 80 posters for Lincoln Center 
you also won a New York Times Best Illustrated Book Award with your wife, correct? Right, right. How do you like working with your wife? Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Illustrating her stuff, I'm, I'm also illustrating her attitude, you know, which is an attitude I married her for. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I, um, I, so the, the, the process of like thinking of, of this vehicle that we're going to do a book about and then thinking of all the ways we could tell a story about this vehicle, which I'm involved, you know, and we sit in the evenings over our martinis and we <laughs> talk about, oh, let's do the, you know, let's change the, uh, the vehicle from being um, like a victim to being a hero or, you know, whatever we're going to do with it. And so it's, it's really interesting. I'm sure and it doesn't feel like work even, right? No, it, it doesn't in a way, I mean. Are there some things that you have to keep in mind while you're drawing for children's books? Are there some boundaries that you have in mind? Uh, well, it, yeah, the boundary is that I have to keep my essential, essential, uh, yeah, you know, sadness <laughs> out of it as much as I can and be as positive as I can because uh, the, the, I mean the, the, the work on the, the Leaving China book was so freeing in that I didn't have to worry about being jolly you know, <laughs> and, and being happier than I really am. So, um, but, the, but it, it's just, it, I get off on the energy that I that I think interests kids in in my you know the books we do together that they're very energetic books and I can get into that because I love energy and drawing and energy and characterization uh, so I just use a different part of myself yeah there was one picture in particular that where the uh, they're having a um, a drill on a ship because I think they're either submarines or air attack or something is about to happen. And suddenly he, he does a picture in essentially black and white that has terror in it. Uh, you, you don't have to read anything to know that there's terror. And it was such a, he's able to convey a, a sense of what's happening in the drawing that uh, I find remarkable. I think Kim and I are, uh, I, I like to think that Jim and I are physical cowards. We will avoid anything that is a threat. But we are very brave, I think, on, on a piece of paper. And Jim has tremendous courage in, in what he does on a piece of paper. There are other pictures where he doesn't, it doesn't bother to fill in the color on the figures because he does because he wants you to look at something else in the picture that I, I think is very bold. You have done magazine works for so many different magazines, Rolling Stones, Sports Illustrated, Sesame Street mm. Magazine, Vogue. What about your work makes, gives you so many eclectic possibilities, you think? Marketplaces in the world of media come and go. Uh, there was a time when I it could make a fairly good living doing book jackets. And then that kind of slowed down. Then I was doing all kinds of record album covers, you know, and, um, and then <laughs> that stopped. And then I was doing, well, from the beginning, I've always been doing magazine work. Uh, and we know what happened to magazines, at least what happened to them in relation to illustration. There's very, uh, the, the only real marketplace well, there are lots of little marketplaces, but the, the only big marketplace for magazine illustration is The New Yorker, and, you know, the covers and some stuff inside. So I'm not doing much magazine work anymore, even though I've worked for every magazine in America. But, um, and then, um, then somehow or other, uh, back what, in 1985 or something, I started doing um, theater posters. And of course, the theater has been dying for a hundred years. So uh, any moment now, it will die too, and uh, there won't yeah. be any <laughs> poster <laughs> work. But for the moment, uh, I'm in the you know in the in the death throes of the theater and uh, doing 
doing these posters, which are very unlike any other posters that are being done right now. So I, 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 I'm very lucky to get away with it. You when know? Jim and I started, magazines would send artists to various countries to cover car auctions, to cover golf events, to cover anything. Nobody does that anymore. It's too expensive and everything is done with photographs. So uh, that's the most difficult part of our, our work now is, is that the field has changed underneath our feet. Jim does his book and I'm doing my book and, uh, and, <coughs> and then, we'll, uh, then we'll go on welfare. If you could tell a student of yours or perhaps a, an aspiring artist who wants to one day be where you are artistically, if you could tell them one thing, what would you say? First of all, you got to start by wanting it uh, desperately, you know, to, to have it. Um, and, and secondly, um, to do what people in all creative fields who succeed do, you've got to work it over and over and over again, you know. I mean, a lot of young people going into a creative field somehow feel as if they learn a little, they can jump to excellence with very little intervening work. And the truth is that everybody that's good, if it's a writer, they rewrite, 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 you know. And if it's an artist, redraw, 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 you know. They work very hard. And one of the reasons that I've done the books I've done on my work is to show process and to dramatize. This wasn't easy, folks, you know. I had, I had to struggle. I had to do it over and over again to make it as good good as I wanted it to be. The Two Houses. My father managed a branch of the family business in Qingdao for the first three years of my life. Then we moved to Qifu, another port on the Shantung Peninsula, where the James McMullen Company had its main office. I remember certain things about the big stone house in Qifu. The carpets were rectangles of warm gray bordered by that particularly Chinese pink. At the corner of the room by a window was a big black piano, and near it a fancy looking radio made of different kinds of wood, and a green eye that would get brighter or dimmer as my father fiddled with the knobs. There were lots of cigarettes in silver boxes and flowers on the table. Music played from the record machine and often my father would sing. I remember my Aunt Gladys's house next door. It was also a big stone house, but it smelled different from ours, like old milk. And there was randomness in the way that everything was placed as though it had been dropped in haste wherever it was. There was also a crucifix on the living room wall. It was an object that was missing from our living room. As I was later to understand, the two houses illustrated in their different styles, ours carefully put together for comfort and decorative effect, Gladys's ignored in order to concentrate on missionary tasks. The fact that the family history had created secular and religious branches. The story of our family living a comfortable life in 1930s Chifu, China, had its beginning in the bleak story of my grandparents, James and Lily McMullen, coming to China to work as missionaries. 